Just a few weeks before the lockdown, I was asked to babysit a neighbor's kid while they went to a party related to one of their jobs. I'd never babysat for anyone before, so admittedly, I was pretty nervous. But if I'd known what kind of night I had in store for me, I'd have turned the job down in a second. It was made all the worse by the fact that my parents pretty much assured me that it would be an easy 50 bucks and that the night would be over before I knew it. I had a bad feeling about the whole thing from the start, but my dad actually managed to talk me out of that headspace. Now I wish I'd just trusted my gut and stayed well away. So I wandered over to the house around 7 in the evening, introducing myself to the parents and the kid before they went over a few ground rules. At first, it seemed like my dad was right, that I was just being silly and that, if I played my cards right, I could turn this into a regular earner to fund my weekend shopping habits. The parents were lovely, and so was the kid, so I got pretty chilled pretty quickly and ended up sort of enjoying myself, entertaining the kid after they left with the help of Disney+, Plus, which I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a huge fan of. Anyway, everything is going well until it comes time to put the kid to bed. Then things start getting a little awkward, the kid straight up refuses, and our new, happy little friendship starts to quickly deteriorate. I felt super mean having to lay down the law with the kid, and he went from crying and wailing, to shouting and screaming at me like, I wasn't his mom, he hated me, I didn't belong there. Stuff like that. I actually kinda hurt, and I started to realize that maybe I wasn't ready for that kind of responsibility yet. To be a parent or a guardian, you need to be tough enough to be able to kind of like, be the bad guy, if that makes any sense. And if there are any of you out there that are looking to get into babysitting, thinking it'll be an easy few bucks, please reconsider. I've done way, way easier things for money before and since, things that don't make you feel crappy for having to have shouted at a kid. But after a while, the whole temper tantrum seemed to have tired the kid out, and even though he still seemed upset with me, he went up to his room, got into his pajamas, and climbed into bed to sleep. He asked me to read him a story, and since he'd actually done as he was told, I obliged, and when his eyes finally closed over and his breathing slowed, I snuck out of the room and downstairs to leave him to get some rest. So about an hour or so later, I was sitting on the couch texting a friend of mine, telling them how babysitting was way harder than I thought it was going to be. I'm working through the leftover chicken pot pie that my mom had given me to take over there, catching up on some episodes of The Mandalorian when the family house phone starts to ring. Thinking it was the parents looking to check up on me, I picked up, greeting the caller in the cheeriest voice I could manage. Only, no one on the other end responds. I say hello a few more times, assume it's a bad dial or a bad line, and hang up, heading back to finish off my pie. No sooner am I sat down again, the phone rings again. I was kind of expecting it I suppose, maybe the parents had gone through a tunnel or something, I dunno, but either way I got up again, headed over to the phone, and picked up. Only this time, when I did, I heard breathing on the other end of the phone. I give another cheery hello, but there's just the same breathing coming from the other end. When the person finally speaks, it's this super deep voice, obviously a guy, telling me to check on the sleeping kid. I thought it might have been the kid's dad, but there was also something really weird and distorted about the voice too. I respond like, okay, I'll go check, and the line goes dead immediately. The kid is fine, sleeping like a rock, so as much as I'm kinda creeped out by the weird voice, I figure it must have been the dad. Maybe the parents had argued, I dunno, I tried not to think so much about it. But then pretty much as soon as I'm back downstairs, the phone rings again. No caller ID, no nothing. So I answer, unable to prevent this fear from entering my voice. Big mistake, whoever is calling senses this, and starts to like, giggle down the phone line in that same, weirdly distorted voice. What they said next made my blood turn to ice. Gonna snatch him up. Gonna snatch up the kitty when you're not looking. Gonna get him I went silent, just totally silent out of fear, and that's when I heard a creak in the floorboards above me. Someone was moving around in the rooms upstairs. I pretty much dropped the phone and bolt upstairs and into the kid's room to find that he's still asleep. Or rather, that he very much appears to be asleep. But that same deep, slow breathing isn't there. The more I look, the more like he seems like he's almost holding his breath or something. 
Not only that, but his arm is at this weird angle that makes it look like he's holding onto something under his pillow, something he's trying to hide. In a fury, I pull the pillow up slightly and then realize what's been happening. Whoever thought it was a good idea to buy an eight-year-old kid a phone is straight up crazy. But under that pillow wasn't just a phone, there was a voice distorter under there too. I grab both and run out of the room, back downstairs where the kid starts throwing another temper tantrum. I felt so dumb, completely played by the kid, made to feel terrified and vulnerable. How the hell could someone be so young, yet so goddamn malicious and mean-spirited? The parents arrived back shortly afterward and I didn't mention a word of what happened until they paid me in full. Then I read them the riot act. I was never going to babysit for them, and they were completely irresponsible letting their kid have things like a phone, let alone an actual voice distorter. Turns out the creepy little gadget was their older, college-age kids, and that the little guy was fascinated with it and wouldn't give it back to him. But I didn't care. I wasn't about to put myself out there like that ever again. When I was 17, I used to babysit for our neighbor, who was a single mother going through a particularly nasty divorce. She had two young sons, one was 8 years old, and the other was only around 18 months. They were absolutely adorable and very well-behaved kids, but you could tell that they were going through a lot, and the older one definitely showed signs of stress over the whole thing. I'll never forget the time he asked me why his daddy couldn't live with them anymore, it honestly broke my heart. Not because I didn't have an answer for him, but because to hear it would have just been too much to bear, too much for anyone to bear. Anyway, after a few months of her being alone, she finally decided to get back on the old dating horse. I was so happy for her, after such a rough time, she deserved to find happiness again, to find someone who had the wherewithal to be a real father to those two adorable little boys. So one night, she leaves on her date and says she'll be back around midnight, and not a moment later. Only, she doesn't tell me exactly where she's going, and I have no way to contact her because this was back in the 80s and no one had a cell phone. Well, they did exist, but not in the available, commercial sense. It was all landlines back then, otherwise, this might not have gone the way it did. So on the night in question, I'm chilling on the couch, absent-mindedly flicking through the TV channels. I'd put the kids to bed an hour previously, they're sleeping like rocks, and everything seems fine and dandy. When suddenly, there's a knock at the front door. I wasn't expecting anyone, but then again, it wasn't my house, so I felt kind of obligated to answer and take a message or whatever. Only, as I start walking down the hallway towards the front door, whoever is on the other side starts banging against it and cursing up a storm. Cheryl, I know you're in there. Open the goddamn door. Not what was exactly said, but I'm not keen on repeating some of the words they used. It was really, really harsh. So I'm just frozen, looking at the door in total fright, when the oldest boy came flying out of his room and down the stairs, running to the door and yelling, Daddy's home. I grab him and pull him away from the door. I had no idea what this guy's intentions were, and after all, they were probably divorced for a damn good reason. But I almost fainted with fear when I heard the words, I got my shotgun in my truck, and tonight, I'm gonna teach you a goddamn lesson you'll never forget. He screams this, then I hear his footsteps moving up the gravel path, it appeared he wasn't bluffing at all, and if that was the case, then our lives were clearly in danger. When he gets back, he's banging on the door and threatening to start shooting through it if no one opens it. I grab both kids and run out the back door and across the street to my house where my mom calls the police. When the police arrive a few minutes later, they actually find the ex-husband taking a massive dump on Cheryl's porch. He gets arrested, and I wait with the kids at my house for their mom to show up. Everyone was in tears by that point, even my mom, who was normally a pretty reserved woman. I mean, maybe he was just having a manic episode and no one was in real danger, but honestly, it was one of the most terrifying nights of my entire life. I don't even know where to start this story. I was kind of young at the time, around 7 or 8, but old enough to know what was going on. I lived in a pretty decent neighborhood, but my family was in the process of moving. 
There was a large mixture of families with children and retired seniors living on my street. There was a neighborhood babysitter who took care of my younger sister when she was too young to go to school. She also happened to babysit me on multiple occasions. She was always kind of rude. A pudgy lady with two annoying sons and a very weird husband. A lot of kids got taken care of by her, so my parents trusted her to take care of us. Everything was somewhat normal, except for the fact that she was kind of rude to anybody that wasn't her kid. Her kids were pretty misbehaved. They were always fighting, hitting each other with plastic swords, and screaming at the top of their lungs. At one point, the younger toddlers had a nap and she forced all of the children to sit in a corner and be quiet, besides her kids. Odd behavior for a babysitter, but we never thought much about it. Another thing to mention is that she took naps while babysitting. As in, she didn't pay attention to the kids, she just chewed them away and fell asleep. She was also notorious for giving her sons chocolate milk and telling others they had to have water. My sister and I tried to ignore it, but eventually we were kind of annoyed. My sister had a loud mouth so she told my mom about how she treats the kids she babysits versus her own children. I'd also like to acknowledge that my sister had just turned four, so she wasn't great with words. My mom was angry that the babysitter did that, but let it slide, as we were moving in a month and she didn't know if we were being completely honest. The house we moved to is the house I spent a large majority of my childhood slash teen years in. Things were normal once we transitioned into the new house. Until we got the calls. We changed our phone numbers, so we weren't sure how the babysitter and her husband found it so quickly. She called every day, saying that we needed to pay her and that we owed her money. She was just angry that we had moved and were currently on the lookout for a babysitter that was closer to home. My parents received these calls every day, and they consisted of the babysitter or her husband screaming, which meant that I could hear the voicemails slash calls quite clearly. They kept harassing us, and my parents grew agitated and worried. It all ended one night at around 10 p.m. when my sister and I woke up to the sound of banging on the front door. It continued for a good 10 minutes, and it was very loud. My sister was freaked out, so I decided to go see if my parents were awake. They were. They were just opening their eyes, kind of confused as to what was going on. My dad told my mom to stay upstairs, and he foolishly went downstairs to get the door as I stood at the railing nervously. My sister stayed in the bedroom because she was unaware as to what was actually happening. When he opened the door, I felt sick and terrified. There was my babysitter and her husband who managed to find not only our address, but also our phone number. The husband started screaming at the top of his lungs, yelling you owe U.S. money. Pay U.S. and shaking a knife. Yes, he had a knife in his hand. My dad told him that we didn't and warned him to leave unless he wanted the cops to be called. He didn't care. My dad went to close the door, but he stuck his foot in it, attempting to get inside. My babysitter was also yelling, but I couldn't hear what she had said. We had a phone upstairs so my mother quietly called the cops as my dad struggled to get the door closed. Once he did, the banging and screaming continued. They wouldn't leave our property. I was freaked out, so I started crying. My sister saw me crying, and she did the same. Long story short, about an hour later they left, and the cops arrived, having just missed them. My parents knew their info, based on the fact that they babysat us, so it wasn't hard to track them, and they were arrested. I always wondered if the children were home alone or at a sleepover, especially at a time so late. Regardless, they were released a few days later, but were not allowed to step foot near our house. I'm not sure if the woman still babysits, but if she does, I feel terrible for the kids. We never really knew what their intentions were that night. My dad saw the knife and knew that they were up to no good. All I can say is, psychotic babysitter and her husband, let's not meet. Ever again. The story I am about to tell is a little difficult for me to talk about for two reasons. 
One is that the main part took place when I was around four or five years old, which makes it difficult to remember most details surrounding the story, which is part of the reason it has haunted me for 20 years. The other reason is that this story makes me feel uneasy to even think about, and this might be only the third time I have ever really told it in full. So, a quick background to this story is that I was born and raised in an extremely close, big family. We all lived within about a mile from each other around a large park in a small Texas town. Unrelated fun fact for those horror fans out there, this park is the present day location of the majority of the town that dreaded sundown murders. Now, my family was jam-packed full of aunts and uncles, and I'd say I saw them all at least once a week for my entire childhood. I can't stress enough how close we all were growing up and how trusted they all were, as it plays an important part in this story. This story came up recently between my older brother, my mother, and me because I opened up about a series of nightmares I have been plagued with for as long as I can remember. These nightmares are always very similar and basically always consist of me, as a small child in my childhood home, attempting to escape my house while something horrible chases me. The something is never actually visually seen, but is more like I sense this massive looming person reaching out at me from the dark, and it always catches me before I can get outside. This usually results in me waking up in a sweat. These dreams always seem to center around these very vague yet oddly detailed memories of a babysitter I once had. Here's where it gets odd. These memories I have are almost like dreams. I very specifically remember the details of what was happening and the feelings I had during, but everything else was just out of reach. That goes for the babysitter herself as well. I remember it was a white female who was middle-aged, but I can't for the life of me recall her face. In my memories, it's like I never really got a good look at her. The two specific incidents I remember were not happy ones. The first memory I have is that, Whenever I would get in trouble, what for I have no memory of, I would be forced to sit outside on the back porch in shorts and a t-shirt. During winter. I remember because I would shiver and just sit there quietly, scared complaining would cause more problems. The second memory was even worse to me. The babysitter loved to play this game she made up. She would turn off all lights in the house and go hide deep in one of the back rooms. I was left in the front room and told that if I wanted food or to watch TV, I had to find her first. I never had any idea where she was hiding, and if I ever found her, she would jump out screaming like a mad woman and chase me. I remember her laughter at my fear. I remember often being so frozen with terror that I would sit on the ground near the front door, too scared to go find her. No matter how long I waited, she would never come out of hiding. No matter how hungry I got. I specifically remember this one time very well. I was so little and scared. I was whimpering as I slowly built up bravery to walk the back hallway looking for her. My hunger felt deadly at this point and I needed to find her. I checked bathrooms, bedrooms, and closets and nothing. She was nowhere. I remember standing in my parents' bedroom trying to figure out where she could be when I saw her. She was a dark shape under the big bed peeking at me from under the bed skirt. We stared at each other unmoving. I couldn't make out her face, but I knew she was smiling at me. She was like a crazy, feral animal under there. I remember her sliding herself along the floor so fast. I screamed and turned to run as she made it to her feet. And then the memory goes dark. I don't know what happened after that, and that scares me just as much as the memory I do have of the event. I never shared these memories because they seemed so distant and I often wondered if they were even real. One day when I was in my 20s I mentioned the nightmares to my mother and brother when we were just sitting around talking during one of the weeks where my brother and I were home from college. We often would do this to tell funny stories and remember all of the kids we knew from long before. Then I decided to ask my mom about the babysitter. She seemed confused and told me she never hired babysitters for either I or my brother. Because of how big and close my family was and how protective my mom was of us, she never trusted anyone but families to watch us. My aunts and grandmother were the absolute opposite of the woman I remember. Loving, kind, fun, and treated me like their own children. I couldn't imagine them doing those things to me. 
My mom genuinely seemed confused, but also slightly worried like a mother would be when hearing such a horrible story. She told me she truly couldn't even begin to imagine who I was talking about. With her certainty, and with the memories being so vague in important places, I decided I must have imagined it all. Then my brother brought it up again the next day when we were driving together. Yeah, I remember that, he said with some concern in his voice. Like I remember seeing you get taken outside and being forced to sit there and I thought it was so horrible. I don't know why we never told anyone. He too had no memory of who the woman was, but he remembers feeling defenseless over the whole thing. He only had vague memories of the horrible game she would play, but pointed out how he has absolutely no memory of her ever targeting him with her torment. He remembers the events as if he were an audience member. He did, however, remember things I didn't. This included that I often got in trouble because I would often use my imagination to tell stories and that the babysitter would often get mad when she realized it was not true. This resulted in me getting kicked out of the house. I just want to point out that my brother is only one year older than I am so he too would have been very little. I have thought about bringing it back up to my mom but I honestly trust that she has no idea who I am talking about and I don't want to make her feel horrible about something so long ago that she clearly had no idea about. I just wish I could understand what the hell happened and who the hell she was. My brother never brought it up again after but told me at the time that he had always played that memory off as being so young and just misunderstanding whatever was happening. All I do know is, babysitter from my nightmares, let's please never meet again. Not even in my sleep. Ever since I started living in this house, weird things have been happening. It regularly sounds like someone is walking outside the house at night, and it's starting to freak me and my roommates out. For some context, this is a college house, with four girls in our 20s just looking for a fun place to live. There have been a few different encounters that have led us to this conclusion, and it only continues to fall into place. Let's go back to this summer when the first break-in occurred. It was an evening in September, in the middle of the week. The garage door, which we never use other than for storage, opened, and one of us was at home with music blasting. She heard it and didn't think anything of it, but about five minutes later went upstairs to check and found our garage door open and the back door unlocked. Again, we do not use our garage. She looked around and found nothing missing and figured it was an accident. About a month later, we were having a party. It was around Halloween, and we decided to have a costume party. Around 12 to 1 a.m., someone was in our backyard and turned to see a man walking up the side of our house. When the man saw him, he ran away and up the hill. Around this time, we also had one of our car's windows broken. Nothing was stolen, just the window was broken. Last night, while driving around, we noticed a car we had seen drive by a few times and followed it up the hill. The man in this car, a middle-aged white man, very receding hairline, and arms covered in tattoos, came to a complete stop in the middle of the street and turned around to look at us, then pulled to the side of the road. He waited there for a few minutes, and we waited one street over. We saw him turn left and followed him into the neighborhood in front of ours. We lost sight of him and drove around the neighborhood a bit more. When driving in front of our house, we were wondering if anyone behind could see into our rooms and went to look in the street behind. The house that had a direct view into my room happened to have this same car that was driving around our house sitting right in front of it. This car is very distinct. It's an old white sedan with a black shoe mark on the rear bumper. We immediately went back to our house and looked out the window at the house and realized we had seen someone there before. On multiple separate occasions, there was a middle-aged man standing in the window looking at our house or sitting on the back porch in a lawn chair facing our house. Last night when we went to bed, my roommate had her window open and heard footsteps, our fence gate open, and car doors. The footsteps sounded like they were directly outside her window, and I also heard them. Normally, I wouldn't jump to conclusions, but I feel like these occurrences just connect too well to be coincidental. If anyone has any ideas or input, please let me know. We are genuinely getting scared. I will update if anything else happens. This is a real story that's happening now, 
but this all really started on my birthday. I did speak with an authority about these instances, but I'm open to hearing your takes as well. It's been pretty frightening. Quick backstory, I am a 27-year-old female and I live with a female roommate named Julia and her boyfriend. About a year ago, Julia and I started going to a hangout spot and met a woman working there around our age, Sam. Julia and I stopped going after a while, but I stayed friends with Sam. Not super close, but seeing her once every couple of weeks. She supported my business, brought me small gifts, and invited me to places over the course of the year. I enjoyed being friends with her. On my birthday, Sam and other friends posted my photo on social media. That's when I get a message from an account I don't know, asking me to message them back and discuss a film opportunity. Half curious, I responded. They say a bunch to finally come out and say they are casting adult film stars. They quote me a large amount of money. He says it's very private corn sold overseas that no one will ever see. I declined politely. Honestly chuckled. By the way, they're not google able. There's nothing on their social page or anything about their production company online. The person messaging insists I text their female reference. Curiosity gets the best of me because I do that. Female reference weirds me out. She's normal at first but seems too excited about the actual job. She's encouraging me to do my casting with the person I've messaged and saying I'm very lucky he's even offered as he's only offered that to a few girls. I'm thinking, no woman in corn really feels this excited with it all. I'm weirded out and I blocked her. He messaged me to ask if we talked. I say yes, but decline again and I blocked him now too. I'm embarrassed I even considered. But then, a couple days later my roommate shows me a weird text to her personal number. It's the same people offering the same thing. They say though, we found you on a list you must have signed up. I'm sure my roommate did no such thing. I'll say here that not many people know both me and my roommate. I tell my roommate what happened to me. And we are both confused. For the next four months or so I get text messages. All different kinds, all eventually saying, yes this is an adult film company here and we are so sorry about the mix-up. I answer some nice, I answer some mean, I ignore others completely. They never asked for photos, info, anything really except to consider the offer and maybe come for a drink to discuss in person. That was it. Until yesterday. Sam sends me a message on social media. It's a group chat with a profile I've never seen before. I do creative team building work. Sam wants to introduce me to her friend Dave. Dave needs to hire a team builder at a fancy hotel about an hour away from me. Sam makes the introductions, I say thank you. And then Sam leaves the group chat. Dave's profile is empty. She messages me privately and says basically, I used to casually see this guy. He's good for the job. He's pretty wealthy and I know he owns multiple businesses. He used to be in adult film productions, but I think he's done with that and this would be for a different business he has. Other than that he's a normal dude. I message the man back and ask, what's the company and can I have a website or some pages? Any more info? He says he will launch the website at the event I'm being hired for and that he just bought the company and it's being branded. But Sam is messaging me too. She says he is selling the company and this two-day hotel event is for their farewell party. She suggests I bring my boyfriend since it would be an all-expenses-paid stay. Also, she mentioned she's going to visit this old friend tonight to catch up over drinks. She said she hasn't seen him in a long time. All right. This is weird as heck. The guy is messaging me along the lines of, sorry, I know this is weird. Feel free to bring your boyfriend. He also mentions how he was seeing my friend tonight. I leave him on read until the morning. I send him the weird adult film account and say, this you? They say no, but I don't believe them. They respond thumbs up and leave chat. I had mentioned to Sam months ago about the weird offer and text messages I got. She too said she got bizarre messages in the past. They only stopped when she said she would call the police. 
She didn't offer more detail, but was driving so I didn't push it. So now I message Sam. And I say straight up. Sam, I think this is the person that has been harassing me from different numbers. She acts weirded out and surprised. Asks about the original account that messaged me. Eventually, she closes the convo and goes to bed. I left her on read. I don't answer her call the next day and she texts me, um, that was weird. Call me if you want to chat because I'm confused. I don't respond. Today, she texts me, I'm okay. I wrote her back. Basically saying, listen, you know, I've been weirded out about this and I've been wondering if someone is trying to abduct me. Now I'm wondering if you're involved either innocently or not. It's too much for me. She wrote me back saying more or less she understands that it was a scary weird experience, but she thinks I'm way overreacting, and basically she seems offended that I even could think such a thing. She also said she wouldn't want to ever speak with someone again who could think that about her. She left it with that she lives her life on the straight path, and that she can't let someone try and drag her into something like that. It was a Friday night, and I had gone to bed early as I had work on Saturday morning. After reading in bed for a bit, I drifted off at around 10.30 p.m., only to wake up about an hour later to loud screams and people yelling profanities. I thought my girlfriend was watching a movie with the volume way up, and I went out into the lounge room to ask her to turn it down a little. Instead, the TV was off, and my girlfriend was staring at the front door with her eyes wide. Our apartment is on the ground floor of the building, and so our front door opens directly out into the lobby of the building. The voices in question were coming directly from the lobby I could not make out specifics. In my defense, I was half asleep and the language of the country I live in is not my first language, but there was a lot of swearing involved. My first thought was that it was some kind of domestic dispute, but after listening I realized it was a group of men that sounded extremely aggressive. I looked at the WhatsApp group chat for my apartment building, and to my horror saw a message from one of the people in it that there were armed men in the building, and that we should not leave our flats. The country I live in is experiencing a marked uptick in crime, and I had heard stories of armed groups of men robbing entire apartment blocks, but these had seemed fairly apocryphal to me. However, that was my first thought that these men would kick down our door and rob us. One of my dogs started to growl at the commotion outside I shushed him and thankfully he obeyed. I heard a commotion in the apartment above me and went out to my patio to see what was happening. I heard what sounded like a large piece of furniture being knocked over and women and children screaming in terror. At this point I had no idea what was going on but I knew that by now they would have robbed us already if that is what they had planned to do. My girlfriend and I decided to hide in a small shed at the end of our patio, monitoring the group chat on our phones. Our bigger dog silently stood watch outside the door of the shed, his eyes locked on the sliding door at the end of the patio. I would find my smaller dog later, cowering between the washing machine and the dryer. After ten extremely tense minutes, I heard the screeching of tires signaling what I hoped was the perpetrators fleeing the scene. Eventually, someone in the group chat said the police had arrived, and breathing a huge sigh of relief, I came out of hiding and opened the front door. Alarmingly, on the floor of the lobby there were zip ties that had been cut, and the security guard was talking to one of the tenants. The man was bleeding from a large gash on his face and looked extremely shaken. Over the next few hours the story would unfold. The man I saw, with the gash on his face, was the tenant in the upstairs apartment, the one that I had heard the commotion coming from. He was the owner of an import-export business and, for whatever reason, had a sizable sum of money and cash hidden in his apartment. Someone had obviously found out about it and planned out the robbery that woke me from my sleep on Friday night. A group of eight men had followed him into the apartment building's garage and ambushed him as he got out of his car and, judging from the gash on his face, roughed him up a bit. Some of the group of eight had gone to the lobby, surprised the security guard, and zip-tied him. The remainder of the group had gone up to the apartment, robbed it, and then fled the scene. It is fairly chilling to think that armed men were mere meters from my front door. So, to the armed men that stormed my apartment building to steal my neighbor's cash, let's not meet.
So where do I even begin? In my country, the government decided to offer free professional classes to anyone benefiting from welfare or simply unemployed. As a 30-year-old female, I decided to enroll in one of these classes before moving to another state next year. I wanted to bolster my CV and have an excuse to get out and about since I'm currently unemployed. I specifically chose a social media marketing and management course that started three months ago. Everything was going well, and it seemed like all my classmates and professors were great people. I even started making some friends. I should point out that no one in my class is underage, with the youngest being 21 and the oldest 56. After a couple of weeks of classes, they introduced us to the main curriculum of the course, which included a months-long group project. The project involved inventing a brand from scratch and marketing it on social media as if it were a real product about to launch on the market. I was super excited about this challenge. The groups were chosen at random, and the RNG gods paired me with a 56-year-old woman, whom we'll call M. She had barely spoken to anyone up until that point. Thinking she was nothing but a nice lady, I tried to accommodate her preferences for the project, such as choosing the topic. She immediately started telling me about her skin issue, claiming doctors had only made it worse and that she had cured herself with herbs and essential oils. In hindsight, this was already the first red flag. Her rambling left me scratching my head, and just to break the awkward silence, I suggested we could pick that as a brand idea, a natural remedies, food supplements, and cosmetics brand that wasn't an MLM or a cult. She immediately agreed and smiled like a little girl, which back then made me kinda happy. After that, she picked the name, logo idea, and motto without asking my opinion, saying it felt important to her, put a pin in this for later, and that since I had no experience with this niche, I should learn from her. She insisted so much that I had to comply, and that's when hell started for me. She would call and message me on WhatsApp constantly, insisting on seeing me work in real time on the designs, logos, mockups, etc. because she needed to supervise my actions. Her excuse was that I'm a little girl that hasn't known the world yet. She never liked any of my work and forced me to redo things over and over again. I'm on the spectrum and have a very hard time setting boundaries with people or dealing with the idea of displeasing someone, so I kept pushing myself to stay strong and keep going because I couldn't deal with how this woman would react to anything she might have seen as insubordination. On top of that, I didn't want to fail the course, and from the beginning, all our professors insisted that the group project was vital to the final score. It's in one of those calls that she starts telling me some of the most unhinged things I've ever heard in my life. After seeing me drink a sip of an energy drink, she screamed at me to toss that garbage away and then explained the reason why, in her opinion, energy drinks, sodas, and junk food are infested with nanomachines that infect the human body and rewrite their DNA. She then explained that that's because the great powers are not aliens like most think, but androids and AI hive minds, ready to enslave humanity through biomechanical control. She also kept going on about how AIs exist since before Christ, came from an ancient civilization before the Great Reset, and that all great men in history were actually androids or giants. She did go on a great tangent about Nephilim and such. She also threw in the fact that she's sure dinosaurs are nothing but a fairy tale and could have never existed, so in her opinion, big people can exist but big birds can't. The first incident, the biggest one, happened last month on one weekend evening where instead of slaving away for her, I went out with my mom to visit some friends and be back home the next morning. I forgot my phone at home and realized too late, but since M and I hadn't agreed to work that night, I thought nothing of it. Oh man, was I naive. My phone was blown up with messages and phone calls, all from M except a couple of messages from another classmate of mine that told me she had called him obsessively with demands of him showing up at my front door to make sure I was okay. He had mentioned before we live on the same block. Later that week, I get called into the school administration because M apparently had called them too and told them that I had gone missing for three to four days. I tried in vain to keep it together and just burst into tears in front of the secretaries, telling and showing them all this woman was putting me through, explaining my boundary setting issues, and they decided to immediately inform the professors and find a solution that would have allowed me to not have any more contact with her. 
but before they could take any actions, M and I are informed that one more student was going to join our group, we'll call him T. Nothing much to say about him, he's super nice, and did help out that following week by not complying with M's demands and unreasonable standards, insisting I take time off to do my own things too. For some reason, she never complained about decisions made by T. In my last call with M and T, M goes on another unhinged rant, this one will be relevant later and it's what makes this story fucked up on multiple levels. She claimed she's being gangstalked and sabotaged by Big Pharma because she had invented a miracle ointment that could reconstruct any sort of biological tissue. She said she tested it on the hand of a friend of hers that had third-degree burns, claiming she saw the nerves, tendons, muscles, and skin grow back, saving the hand. She then added that a prototype of said ointment that mostly consisted of garlic and aloe cured her husband from cancer a few years back. She also added like how after an accident over a decade ago, the doctors decided to sabotage her uterus during an emergency surgery to prevent her from having children. More of the big pharma sabotages involved several lawsuits she was involved in. She concludes that she's taking SMM classes with us because she wants to learn how to communicate with social media and the new generations. I'm personally afraid she's going to try to scam desperate people into buying her BS Garling and Aloe Miracle Cure. The second incident happened the next day before class. A friend decided to sit next to me since that class of the day wasn't going to involve the group projects. We put our stuff on the desk and since we were early, decided to go into the next room to get a coffee. M comes in and we hear a commotion in the classroom. When we peek inside, we see her tossing my friend's stuff to another desk. My friend asked what the hell she was doing, and M just coldly responded, The seat next to OP is mine. I nodded at my friend as if to say it's okay to try and defuse the situation before it escalated. Two days later, we were informed that I was swapped from M's group to another one. I will say that finally, I'm working with the girl I made friends with, and we're having a lot of good fun. So well, I thought it was over, no more of M's weird shit, right? Right? The calls and messages from her never ended. Actually, she started obsessively calling the school and the professors as well to protest about the decision of removing me from her group. Her texts were filled with weird trivial questions about random topics or very personal questions, up to 50 to 60 texts per day. At this point, I stopped responding almost entirely to her and started screenshotting everything she was sending me. This leads us to the third and last incident, at least so far, that happened last week. I can't go into too much detail because it involves geopolitical beliefs and I don't want a war in the comments. The short, clean version of events is, M, in class, asked the professor a question that involved a very important global matter. He replied and then asked us about our opinion. Two people spoke before I did, giving examples of people or brands getting cancelled for sharing political stances unwisely, and how a problematic or controversial history or presence on social media might negatively impact one's chances of employment. It was only once back home I realized M had sent me several rage-filled texts, claiming I was incredibly rude to have answered to her instead of letting the professor answer, and that she was expecting my apologies. I wrote a long text to her explaining myself, told her I would not apologize since I had done nothing wrong, and finally blocked her number. She thankfully hasn't been able to find me on social media yet because I don't use my real name online. Since then she's been missing all classes, which is nice because I really didn't want her to try and confront me in person. But it's what I've learned today from one of my classmates during break that left me horrified and pushed me to write this post. One of my classmates, we'll call her Y, told me M and her had been exchanging texts from time to time, mostly because Y took pity on M thinking, like I did at first, she was just some weird old and lonely lady. In one batch of texts, she goes into detail about her husband that had passed away from cancer a few years back. Some of the texts read, we fought tooth and nail, we didn't bend over to men nor God. But they took him away from me anyway. I was so close to keep him with me, at least I know he trusted and followed me until the end. These are verbatim, because after putting two and two together me and why, we figured she's either delusional and lying about everything or she tried to cure her husband from cancer with her ointment instead of traditional medicine, effectively killing him. 
Also, we found out she's already selling her services inside of a SPA belonging to a relative of hers, using the name she picked for our project. She's also been using my work for her personal social media pages involving her services, which explains why she was so obsessive about supervising my work. She was basically getting free commissions out of me. Today was my last day of class before the Christmas holidays, and after that it's just going to be three more months until classes are over. I don't know where this story will lead me to further, but honestly, I hope she never shows up to class ever again. This incident took place a few years ago and is the reason I'm much more cautious when I'm out and about nowadays. I always carry my keys between my fingers past 6 p.m. if I'm alone, and I keep spray deodorant in my bag if I can fit it. Occasionally, I even carry a craft knife in my bag. I'm sorry this story is long, but I kept trying to shorten it, and it felt like I was leaving out too many details. Writing it out was a bit of a release for me. I never spoke about it in detail with anyone. My parents and sister know the rough outlines, but not the details of what happened. I had an interview in the city center and met up with a couple of girlfriends afterward. I was dressed quite nicely, a white blouse, black cardigan, black trousers, not jeans, and some cute kitten heels. It had been raining, so I was quite damp and black. You can fill in the blanks. I looked like the result of a wet t-shirt contest or a car wash gone wrong. My friends had to go home, so I hopped on the bus that stopped essentially right outside my house. It wasn't late, maybe around 4 p.m., and in the summer, so it was still light out and had stopped raining by now. I sat at the back of the bus where there are usually nine seats, four facing backward, five facing forward, so that the heat from the engine of the old bus could warm me up a little. There was already a guy, Frank, sitting there, but he was tucked away in a corner, and I had headphones in, so I assumed he wouldn't talk to me or was harmless. I was incorrect. As soon as the bus took off, Frank shuffled over next to me and said something. I took an earphone out and asked him what he said. He basically just said, hey, how's it going? What VE you done today, missy? I replied politely and started putting my headphones back in, but he started talking again. This time he introduced himself and reached out to shake my hand. I gave him a fake name, thank you, parents, for teaching me about quick thinking and hammering it into my skull, and shook his hand. He wouldn't let go for like a solid minute and was staring at my cleavage before I even said my name. I pulled my hand away, and he put his hand on my thigh. This is where I should have involved the bus driver or at least moved seats. Guess what? I did neither of those things. We talked for about five plus minutes more. I think the physical touch sort of sent me into minor shock, to be honest. I froze. He started asking me personal questions after asking how the interview went, etc., such as who I lived with, would anyone be home when I got home, etc., I lied and told him my butch-ass shit girlfriend would be waiting for me as she'd cook dinner for me. I was hella single, but he didn't need to know that. As all creepy old men on buses do, he started asking about our relationship. How long had we been together? Would we get married? Did we want kids? Would we need a donor? Etc. Your usual shit, really. While he was asking all this crap, a young guy, Sam, who was maybe my age at the time, had gotten on the bus made eye contact with me, and sort of half-smiled, then went to the top deck. So after Frank asked the, somehow, line-crossing question of will your girlfriend be waiting for you in the shower? I stood up, told him I'd recognized a friend go upstairs, and practically ran up the stairs to the top deck, where I explained everything to Sam. He let me sit by him in case Frank came upstairs after me. The question was line-crossing for me, I think, because of the way he stared at me when he said it. I vividly remember him licking his lips and clearing his throat and everything. It was vile. I got home about five minutes after going upstairs. Frank was thankfully no longer on the bus. When I got into the house, nobody was home. My parents and sister were all out elsewhere, and I tried calling them all, but nobody answered, so I cried and shook and threw up. Alone. For almost two hours. 
I was a shaky mess even when they got home, and I had nightmares for weeks and saw him everywhere I went, although when I check, he definitely wasn't there. I never saw him again and wrote in a report to the bus company, I think, telling them the day and rough time I was on the bus, where I was sat, and roughly what he and I looked like. I honestly got the creeps just writing about this, even though I've written about it briefly in an Ask Reddit comment in the past. So, to the creepy piece of shit on the bus who frankly ruined my day after having an amazing interview, let's not meet ever, ever again. This incident occurred when I was 15 years old, during my sophomore year in high school. At the time, I was going through a phase, as most teenagers do. I wore short shorts and fishnets, and my shirts weren't exactly what a 15-year-old should wear. Looking back, I cringe at my outfits and makeup, but that was then. I was involved in my high school color guard, which is part of the band, but we don't play instruments. We would spin colorful flags and use rifles and sabers in our performances. It was fall, and we were practicing our show, doing a lot of reruns to try and perfect it before our usual competitions. Normally, practice would start at 4 p.m. and end almost at 9 p.m. A little backstory to help understand the story I'm about to tell, I didn't live close to my high school like most people who went there. The drive would take at least 15 minutes, and walking from my house to school would take an hour. Taking the bus would take 45 minutes. My brother worked late hours, and my parents didn't get off work until midnight. So my next best choice was the bus. The neighborhood wasn't the worst, but it also wasn't safe to be walking home at night. Even before this night, I was always a little on edge. So on this night, I said goodbye to my friends and, not wanting to bug them for a ride, I walked to my bus stop. I had my cell phone and started scrolling through Facebook. I would occasionally glance up and look at my surroundings. I noticed a car slowing down in front of my bus stop, but it immediately signaled to make a turn to my left. I didn't think much about it since there are houses behind that bus stop. It wasn't weird until I noticed this car doing that again and then again and again. I get scared easily, and I am already a paranoid person. So this had my alarm bells ringing. It wasn't until he had basically passed by me for the seventh time that he finally parked on the curb by my bus stop. That's when I got a look at him and took in his appearance. This happened a couple of years ago, so my memory isn't great. But I do remember he was Hispanic and reminded me a bit of an uncle of a friend of mine. He spoke his first words to me that sent me panicking. To translate what he said to me in Spanish, it was basically him saying, Hey, come over here. Do you need a ride? Hop in. I'll take you. He kept saying that for a good five minutes and then suddenly drove off. I then let out a breath I didn't know I was holding in. I was trying to calm myself down and tell myself it was over. But I knew it wasn't, and I was right. His car showed back up, and the thing about my bus stop is that there is a house behind it. Except before the house, there is a good amount of space with just dirt. Cars can actually go in this space, and I've seen it before. But for some reason, it shocked me to see him park behind my bus stop. At this point, I was panicking, and tears were falling down my cheeks rapidly. At this moment, I was already thinking I'll never see my family because this man was going to take me. Also, I was frozen in place, so I already know in crucial moments like this my reaction is to freeze. Not fight or flight, freezing is what I do. The worst thing to ever do. I still believe it was the prayers that I was saying that saved me. At this time, these two bulky guys were close by and were walking their pit bull on a leash. I'm a sucker for dogs, but at this time, I couldn't speak or awe. In my frozen state, I knew this was my only chance and fought to get the words out. It was my only chance to save myself, and I'm so glad I spoke out. Excuse me, please, please see can you guys stay with me. That man in the car right there won't leave me alone, I'm very scared. Please, please stand by my side. My words choked up, and I was shaking at this point. The guys were kind-hearted and agreed. To come off more intimidating, they crossed their arms across their chest and flexed a bit. 
They stared down the man who at this point had his window up and began reversing. He drove off, and the guy stayed with me until my bus came. At this time, it was 9.59. I know that some of you might ask, why didn't you go back to your high school? Well, at this point, no one was really there, mostly everyone had been picked up. I had a cell phone, but no one was going to be able to pick me up. This was my only transportation, and at that time, I didn't know about Lyft or Uber. I'm not even sure it was a thing back then. Overall, I'm just happy to have been saved that day by the kind-hearted guys. I hope one day I could see the guys that stayed with me at the bus stop to thank them. Because of them, I am here and able to share this story of mine. I'm still shaken up at the memory of it because of the scare it gave me. After that incident, I asked for a ride for the remaining of that season. Sometimes even when you don't want to bug people with rides, it doesn't hurt to ask. It's better to be that annoying person than finding yourself in my situation. Stay safe when taking the bus at night. This incident occurred about a year ago when I was 22. While I don't consider myself particularly attractive, I do have a youthful appearance, and this often attracts unwanted attention from creeps and potential predators. I look significantly younger with makeup on, and even younger when I dress in loose-fitting clothing, which is my usual style. It was around 9 p.m. when I boarded the bus I usually take. I managed to find a seat and glanced around to see who else was getting on. I was hoping to spot someone who might need the seat more than I did, like an elderly person. That's when I noticed a man who stood out from the rest. He was dressed casually but neatly and had a lean build. His most striking feature was his intense gaze, which was fixed on me. I started to feel uneasy. Most people would have looked away by now, but he didn't. I tried to rationalize his behavior, thinking maybe he was just tired and staring into space. But there was something about his look that made me uncomfortable. It wasn't a blank or tired stare, it was focused and intense. I looked away and tried to distract myself by looking out the window, but I could still see his reflection in the glass. Despite the growing unease, I wasn't afraid. There were still many people on the bus, and my stop was several stops away. I convinced myself that I was just being paranoid. As the bus continued on its route, the number of passengers dwindled, and the man moved to a seat two rows ahead of me. Instead of facing forward like everyone else, he turned to the side, giving him a clear view of me. I debated getting off the bus early and walking home, but I quickly dismissed the idea. I didn't want to give him the opportunity to follow me. Instead, I tried to act as if I didn't notice his stare. I'm not sure how convincing I was, but he didn't change his behavior. I told myself that at least I wasn't showing him that he was scaring me. As my stop approached, I decided to wait until the last possible moment to get off. When the bus stopped and the doors opened, I looked out and then back at him. I saw him tense up for a moment, but then relax as people started getting on. I thought I had fooled him, but as I got off the bus, he jumped up and followed me. I was at a loss for what to do. My house was only 300 meters away, but I didn't want him to know where I lived. My street was poorly lit, and not many people were around at that time of night. I decided to make a detour at the next intersection. I crossed the street and waited for the light to change. When it did, I crossed again and started walking uphill. I glanced behind me and saw him following, about two meters behind. I tried to stay calm and act natural, but I could feel my heart racing. As luck would have it, there wasn't much traffic coming from the right. I waited for a car to approach, not too close but not too far, and then I ran across the street. I glanced back and saw him starting to cross, but then he backed up as another car approached. I took advantage of the distraction and made my way through a crowd of people waiting for a bus. I finally reached my street, but I didn't want to lead him straight to my house. I crouched between two parked cars and watched as he approached the corner. He looked around, but he didn't see me. After a few moments, he turned and walked away. I waited a few more seconds before making a run for it. I made sure everything was locked when I got home and was relieved to see my dad there. 
Looking back, I realize I could have called my dad to pick me up from the bus stop. I don't know why that thought never occurred to me at the time. It would have been the smart thing to do. Honestly, my drug use kind of started like almost everyone else. Little bit of weed here, some drinking there, and a ton of good memories. Let's not forget the friends we meet along the way. Eventually, that led me to LSD, mushrooms, DMT, KET, and our friend Frosty the Snowpile. Now that we have established that I like drugs, let's get into why you shouldn't do them. 2019 is the year it all began. I was a 19-year-old fresh out of graduation from EMT school and decided to spend the day celebrating with my friend. Let's call him Quincy, who was a 19-year-old male. It just so happened that it was Quincy's birthday and was having a gathering at his home for the occasion. I got in my car and headed over there. Arriving in a smoke-filled room with people all over, I was greeted with cheers. We had a wonderful time. During the occasion, I met Darren who was also a 19-year-old male. Darren and I were locked in from the start. We met through Quincy and hung out a few times at the skate park with him, but up until that point that's all it was. Since then, we have been best friends. His girlfriend Lauren, who was a 20-year-old female, and pretty much everyone else made fun of us. Our bromance was crazy to them. We did everything together. That man became my brother. When everyone else fell off me, he was making moves that continued to solidify our brotherhood. A few years go by and the year is 2022. Me, Darren, and Lauren decided to move in together. Over the years, we had been through a lot of tough stuff and continued to stay solid and have each other's back. Wasn't a damn thing I wouldn't do for that guy. About five months into us moving in, we hit mad hard times. Living off of ramen and sharing a car. We were feeling helpless in our situation. We had to turn to something. A few months of this and an opportunity falls in our lap. An opportunity to make a lot of money and finally solve our issues. Selling drugs. Whatever we could get our hands on for the most part minus the crazy ones. Our bread and butter though was cocaine. Here's the thing, everyone and their cousins sell it but none of it was pure. We changed the game. It was a great safe product for a good price. We took off fast and just like that, all of our issues were solved plus more. We partied a little bit and of course had our fun, memories I'll never forget for the rest of my days. They always said never get high on your own supply, but when your supply is as good as it is and the money is still coming in, of course you're going to use it. Things were really good and they were about to get better. After some time we had saved up enough money, along with some investors, and knowing people we were going to open a dispensary. And it was moving fast. By the middle of October we had everything set. We got the okay from all the people we needed them from, had a building ready to go, and were set to open on New Year's Day. But at the end of October, I got into a car accident. I totaled my car and was injured in the process. Nothing serious, but put me out of work for a while, so in the meantime, I decided to stay with my dad while I healed and got my car situated. I was in and out of the house and had left Darren to handle all of the business affairs while I took some time for myself. For days before Thanksgiving, at 9 a.m., I woke up to a phone call from Darren. He said, I bro, I need you to come home. We need to talk. I'm not one to question or ask why, so I got up, borrowed my dad's vehicle, and drove to the house. He then followed me back to drop my dad's vehicle off because my dad needed to leave somewhere. Why didn't he just come pick me up? Don't ask because I don't know. There was something wrong though. Darren was sweating, paranoid, and not at all himself. The world was out to get him. After spending hours trying to get him to calm down, something switched. He was seeing things that weren't there. Trying to fight me, yelling at the neighbors, it was a mess. And I was starting to become hopeless. Even as an EMT, I was stumped on what to do. Because a situation like that is usually handled by just taking someone to a hospital. But we didn't want to use this option because we thought he was just high. 
We gathered all of the firearms and put them in a safe place. Got into his room, I gave him two Xanax bars and stayed with him till he eventually fell asleep. It's now 5.30 p.m., me and Lauren spent the rest of the day just talking about what happened, game plans if he woke up in the same state, and everything else. Eventually around 8.30 p.m. he woke up and was completely normal, alert, and oriented. He knew where he was, but didn't remember what happened. After explaining what happened, we had a serious conversation about not using anymore and that was that. They got dressed and drove me back to my dad's. Darren and Lauren were planning on going home and getting some food. I dapped up Darren, told him I loved him, and to talk to me tomorrow. Little did I know this would be the last time I saw him. At 3.58 a.m. the next morning, I got a call from my neighbor. But I don't answer. Immediately, the neighbor calls me again. I have a rule that if you call me once, I won't answer, but if you call me a second time, it has to be important. I pick up the phone and hear, dude, what the hell is going on at your house? I responded groggy and confused, the hell do you mean what's going on at my house? He responds, I saw Darren and Lauren both leave on a stretch and there are like six cop cars in front of your house. I don't know bro, but you need to get over here immediately, this looks bad I got up, threw the first item of clothing I could find, and broke every traffic law I could have. I arrive at my home. Cops are going all through my house. Not knowing what happened, I thought that they were going through the house because no one could tell them no. I ran up and said, y'all need to get out of my house. You need a warrant. And the cops' next words changed my life forever. The officer said, we don't need a warrant. Your house is a crime scene, but refused to tell me what happened or the condition of my friends. Now comes the blur. I was calling hospitals and family members. Having to tell parents that their children were in the hospital, I didn't know which one, and I didn't know why or what happened. Three hours later, detectives finally came and started asking me questions. The questions were, who lives here? How long? How many firearms are in the house? How was Darren and Lauren's relationship? Were they arguing? These questions only led me to assume the worst. I stopped the cops and said, look, I worked in EMS. I understand what y'all are doing. I need to know what's going on. I'm tired of being left in the dark. I'm going to start saying what I think happened and you are to stop me if I'm wrong. Did Darren shoot Lauren? Did he freaking do that? Did Darren do that and then shoot himself? The cop's answer was, typically people don't say things like that unless they know something. I waited another two hours and at this point, finally the house was cleared and the police were done with their investigation of the crime scene. Most of the police had left, but there was an officer sitting around. To this point, I still haven't seen the house, but I am preparing myself for something bad. I walk up to the cop and say, hey dude, can you tell me what I'm about to walk into? Or anything about my friends? The cop had a grave look on his face. I asked, is Lauren okay? He responded, she was intubated as she left. I then asked about Darren. The officer looked down at the steering wheel and said, I don't know man, it's pretty bad. If I'm being honest, I recommend hiring a company to clean the place up. Most of it is localized to the bedroom, but it's pretty bad. I'm sorry for what you are about to walk into. I asked for some gloves knowing that I can't afford a bio cleaning service. The things I saw in that house will stick with me for the rest of my life. The fact I had to clean up the mess felt like I was picking up the pieces of disaster. The home I've been in for so long felt not like my home, but a whole new country. I was left confused, heartbroken, and being that everyone knew how close we were, everything fell on me. I was the support person for everyone else while I was falling apart. That and I was the homeowner. No one ever tells you that the police don't do anything after they are done or the responsibility that comes with having a crime happen in your house. Thank God for Billy. He helped me out a lot with the house and moral support. I don't know where I'd be without the guy. If you do drugs, then cool. But drugs have consequences. Not only after long-term consumption. They happen at any time. Darren was a protector, 
a good man, and had plans on marrying Lauren. He was about to take custody of Lauren's cousin's kids due to bad parenting. If you asked anyone, they would all tell you that none of this made sense. He never even raised his voice at her. The only factor that could ever make sense is drugs. Cocaine has side effects such as delirium, psychosis, hallucinations, paranoia, and irritation even after use has stopped and can last for days. What happened between the hours of 8.45 p.m. and 3.30 a.m. will never be known. But it's safe to assume it's related to it. Why take the chance? I wish I never did. I have always been interested in the paranormal. I believe in it, but I also feel like the average person thinks every bump in the night is paranormal, and I consider myself to be somewhat skeptical and scientific among believers. True paranormal experiences are far rarer than people will admit. One night, I was up late and looking for things to do and ended up on a random Craigslist ad for a volunteer paranormal investigator in a local group. I emailed, thinking I'd probably never hear back, but ended up getting a response, eventually did a practice investigation with this relatively young group and was invited to be the science officer of the team. Over the year I participated, we did a lot of investigations, but anything my colleagues got excited for, I could always scientifically or logically explain as unlikely to be paranormal, despite the other's arguments and protests. In my town, there is a park that was once a graveyard for the pioneers and key people when the town was young. In the 1970s, the city decided that they would relocate the tombstones and turn the graveyard into a park, as everyone in that graveyard had been gone over 100 years and were no longer visited. Apparently, none of the bodies were moved, and in a quiet corner of the park, there does still stand a beautiful row of gravestones. For all the reasons you can imagine, some of them may even be true, the park has a lot of lore about various hauntings. One night, we were doing a fun practice investigation in this park. We had walkie-talkies, and the boys, young men around 25 years old at the time, decided to split off from the girls, all of us young women around the same age. We girls investigated the parking lot, which was supposedly where various clergy had been buried, and the boys investigated in a canyon at the back, between the gravestones and the busier street. As we were asking questions into our recorder, we were slightly startled by the walkie going off and the voice of the team leader excitedly telling us to come to the canyon, quick. Without asking any questions, the three of us women began to walk quickly to the opposite side of the park, toward the canyon. As we were about 2-3 RDS of the way across the park, I felt a punch in my gut that left me breathless. At the exact same time, one of the other women fell to the ground and the third also stopped and doubled over. I asked if the girl who fell on the ground was okay. She said she felt like something pushed her. I shared that I felt like someone punched me in the gut and knocked the wind out of me, and the third girl said she felt the same as me. The other two girls felt like something was trying to keep us from the boys and were scared to keep going, but I wasn't having it. I wanted to make sure the boys were okay. I convinced the girls to continue, and when we got to the canyon, the boys were fine, they were just getting some good voice recordings and wanted us to share in the experience. We told them what had happened and the boys seemed uncharacteristically unconcerned. That was probably Elmer, a name that showed up on one of the gravestones and was purported to belong to a man who wasn't very kind to women. We got some really clear responses in a female-sounding vocal tone on the recordings from the canyon that night and nothing at all from the parking lot recordings. I could somewhat be skeptical of the question and answer session recordings because there is car noise, etc. from a busier nearby street, and locals walk dogs and hang out on the playsets when they can't sleep at night. So there is added noise that could be construed as voices if you really wanted to explain it away. The three-in-one takedown of us girls is still, to this day, the only experience I can't explain away in the entire year I was involved in that group. This turn of events was relayed to me by an old on-off friend of mine, you know, one of those people you haven't seen or heard from in anywhere between weeks and years, but with whom you share enough history and meaningful experiences so as to never truly lose touch. I mean, the guy was at my wedding for goodness sake, he'd been practically family for a few years back before life happened. 
but I digress. In any case, his family is still unsure how to proceed, so in order to protect the privacy of all parties involved, let's just call him Vince. The two of us loved watching professional wrestling shows together, from our primary school days all the way through young adulthood. The story was told to me by what I could only describe as something that had once been Vince. The person I met behind the old burger joint, he'd insisted, outside, no people, was a battered, crumbling shell of the charismatic and mischievous at times friend I'd remembered. He looked emaciated, exhausted, bags under his eyes, wrinkles decorating his grayish face. Damn, he looked like a 50-year-old dealing with chronic health issues due to decades of chain smoking. At first, I hadn't recognized him, not until he called my name and attempted a courteous smile. Had his peculiarly overgrown, greasy, disheveled hair not been there for everyone to see, I would have thought of heartbreaking words like chemotherapy and radiation at this point. Please allow me to say that if any of you have ever had to witness a loved one going through that, my heart goes out to you. Vince, it's good to see you, buddy. I said in the most cheerful voice I could muster and put my arms around his shoulders. He didn't hug me back. He just sort of leaned forward so as not to leave me hanging. I could literally feel his bones poking at my chest and arms. Good, good, you know, he answered, probably not realizing I hadn't yet gotten around to posing the generic how have you been? He sat down, which was a little weird as it was raining earlier and the sidewalk was wet and muddy. I'm going to tell you something now, and I need you to listen to me, he said, avoiding eye contact. Sure, mate, lay it on me. I said smiling, still trying to make our encounter slightly more normal and not as awkward, for me at least. This is the story he told me, from his perspective. This job I got back then, a little after we'd lost touch. The position stated junior acquisition manager. It was basically just sales of higher status, you know, the bigger fish, the bigger numbers. They'd send me to handle delicate matters, like people refusing to sell due to non-financial reasons. You know the deal with these people. The tiny store has been in their family since their great-great-grandfather built it with his own two hands, where their spouse is buried in the yard and in many years their children will be two, etc. I go there and work my magic. Find an angle to work, a pressure point to exploit, anything to make them sign the bloody contract and get my juicy commission. When I'd first started working sales, I'd feel bad, you know? Shoving these useless products into people's faces, their minds. I didn't think I'd make it more than one month, and then, as it turned out, I was a natural. Customers would actually tell me that they were uncertain about whatever crap I'd been selling at the time, but I sounded like an honest person so they felt at ease trying it. But I knew better, you know? I knew I was selling them useless, unnecessary shit. It's not the quality, you know. It's not that we scam people, everybody got what they paid for, it was just stupid. Like the last gig I'd worked before reaching management for major insurance agency, name redacted in order to avoid potential liability. A newlywed couple who just signed their lives away to mortgage didn't need our premium selective house insurance policy, the generic one they'd already had would cover enough scenarios and offer more than adequate compensation. I still convinced them to buy it. The old man whose wife had been bedridden and depended upon the care of her home nurse didn't need the complimentary benefits package, and God knows he couldn't afford it. That money would come from his already meager pension. He'd probably have to skim and borrow just to be able to afford food and medications. I knew that because we'd purchased all these details, all this allegedly private information, from companies with privacy policy agreements people should have paid more attention to. Doesn't matter. I still did it. In fact, after a couple of months, I'd found out that I could easily change my intonation and speech flow in order to turn on what my superior called persuasion mode. Go whisper in their ears and get us that money, she'd tell me and wink. And I would. Heck, I'm not gonna lie, I enjoyed it. The challenge, the hunt, the conquest. I couldn't get a girl or win a brawl if my life depended on it, as you know, but this... This I could do better than most people, perhaps better than anyone. It made me proud, confident, even euphoric. 
It was the best high in my life, man, forget about that first huff of weed on grade 11. I was flying, and for the first time, I was also the pilot. One afternoon, I convinced a family of illegal immigrants to sell me their property. A cop, some friend with benefits of my superior, gave her the tip about a family about to be processed by immigration services, probably deported. Something about a huge fake visa scheme that blew up when that crime boss had been arrested way back. So, the way I saw it, why not have some money in your pockets while you're at it, am I right? If they're going to be deported anyway, why not liquidate the funds? I mean, if I do nothing, the authorities seize the property due to it being purchased illegally, in a manner involving fraudulent conduct or whatever. Nobody would care that that family had been scammed, that they had probably thought they were paying for actual visas. They'd still take their house, throw them in a cell, and then on a bus back to Third Worldville. So, I was doing them a favor. Yeah, I know what you think, that kind of low-level self-deceiving crap ain't supposed to work on grown-ups, especially not on me, the regional king of bullshit. But it did, I guess because I wanted it to. And if I was going to save them from poverty in their new lives, I might as well cut some of the corners, right? So what? Without me, they'd get nothing, wouldn't they? A little is better than nothing, isn't it? I told them about the fake visa bust, explained how I was giving them their only chance of being deported with money in their pockets to feed their kids, then finally threatened to call immigration myself that very moment. The father had tears rolling down his cheeks when he told his wife to bring him a pen. That contract was for 30% of the price my superior had authorized me to offer. I told them the highest I could offer was a sum equal to 20% of that number, then faked a phone conversation to my boss in which I pleaded with them to offer a little bit more because it's a family with children. I was lying my ass off, man, and it came as naturally as sneezing when you have to. I wasn't even thinking. As I left, the mother looked at me with what I could only describe as grave disappointment, the way your mom would look at you if you were ever arrested for something like child porn. I smiled at her, not empathetically, but triumphantly, and wished her a good day. I knew I was getting a fat bonus and probably a promotion soon enough, and to hell with the collateral damage, that's just life. When I told my superior, she was ecstatic. Vince, my boy, you've just said your future, and it's bright and full of cash, she said. I was quite excited myself. Since it made no sense to start working another case at that time, I simply called it an early day and thought I'd treat myself to a nice meal in the area. The fair was in the neighborhood, so there were many food stands offering all sorts of foreign delicacies, and I stopped near a Middle Eastern stand. Do you know what shawarma is? Never mind. As I was finishing, a marching band of clowns passed near the stands, and everyone started clapping and lifting up the children so they could get a better look. While watching the rather odd-looking cheap clown costumes, I noticed one of the tents to the north had a big fortune teller's sign on it. My superior's words were still playing back in my mind, so I thought to myself, why not? Pay some old crone a few coins and have her tell me how successful and amazing I'm going to be. It's not like I'd been in the habit of being so wasteful with my money. It was sort of a momentary whim, a one-time thing. However, as I drew near the tent, I started feeling quite embarrassed. It was ridiculous. Why would I throw away money like that? I could give these coins to a hungry beggar for some food or booze or whatever rocks their boat on a cold, lonely night in the streets. I could put it in my old piggy bank for a rainy day. Heck, I could toss the coins to a bloody wishing well and it'd make more sense than seeing a self-proclaimed fortune teller. So, I went back to my seat next to the food stand and ordered a dessert, because why not? A few moments after I'd left the food stand, I suddenly heard a hoarse, loud voice saying, or rather shouting, well it's about time. I instinctively turned my head towards the sound and saw a short, skinny old woman dressed like she'd just left a hunchback of Notre Dame costume rehearsal for her part as a gypsy. The big, round ring earrings, the purple untidy pieces of fabric covering her, the bandana on her head, even her walking stick appeared to be some tacky replica used in a play. And it sort of stood out, because the fair wasn't designed with any other gypsy motives, I mean everything else was fairly standard, 
clowns, Ferris wheel, cotton candy. However, even with all that, her most distinctive feature was without a doubt her eyes. They were simply black, meaning the irises were somehow blacker than the pupil. Don't ask me how. It was because of her eyes and how they'd simply commanded all of my attention in a single moment that I noticed her gaze was, for some unknown reason, fixed on me. I wanted to say something, or maybe do something, but every time a thought of optional words or actions came to my mind, I lost it because I kept noticing, again and again, how unnaturally black her eyes looked. Well, she asked in a scolding voice, are you going to keep me waiting for long? Tell me, are you always in the habit of being late to your appointments, or is this especially for me? I finally managed to stutter and I beg your pardon ma'am, to which she chuckled oh, begging already? And we haven't even started yet. Well come along then, and she gestured me towards the open flap of the tent, which, I should add, appeared completely inconspicuous compared to the other tents, stands, and booths, but for the fortune teller sign. I'm not sure why, but I followed her inside. It was nothing like what you'd imagine. No incense, no crystal ball, no astrological maps, no rolled up scrolls, not even flowers in a vase. Simply a small plastic table with two little stools. She sat on one and pointed at the other. I'm sorry, ma'am, I said while sitting down, I believe there might have been a mistake. Well, I'd say, she shouted again, your appointment was for almost 12 minutes ago. I must be getting soft in my old age, or I wouldn't even bother with you. At this point, I started getting annoyed with the entire predicament. Listen, lady, I said, standing up, I've made no appointment with you, I've never even seen you in my life, I have no idea who you are. But if that's how you speak to your customers, I can see why you can't afford better interior decorations. I was about to walk out the tent when her voice sounded again, even louder. Sit down, Vincent. She used my friend's full name. Do not presume me to be one of your hapless victims. Your poisonous deception has no potency in my ears. I turned around and looked at her. I, I'm no deceiver. That's all I could come up with. I wanted to ask how she knew my name, why she thought she could berate me like that, but that's all I could manage, a defensive mumble. Oh, aren't you now? She asked, her voice reeking of contempt. She knew. I don't know how she knew, I don't know how I knew that she knew, but looking in her eyes, I felt more ashamed than ever before. In fact, the shame I felt was greater than anything I've ever felt before, or will ever feel again. I fell to my knees, trembling as I sobbed uncontrollably. There it is, she smirked, obviously pleased with herself. Let me tell you some stories, some juicy gossip, like you city folk are so happy to spread. Let's make it something relevant, something about you and some of the people you've met these past few months. How do you call it at the office, follow-up? I wanted to answer her, mainly to ask her to stop, but I hadn't yet found my bearing. Hmm, let's see now, where to begin? She told me about each and every case I handled, each and every person I manipulated, conned, and practically swindled for my financial profit. A girl who became a prostitute because her mother had no money left after her father passed, because all their savings had gone into the premium medical insurance policies, the ones I promised would save his life. A bedridden elderly woman who somehow managed to place an emergency call when her husband didn't answer her from the living room and the EMTs found him dead on the floor after he had fainted due to starvation combined with taking his pills on an empty stomach. And finally, the two parents who would soon be called to testify against the crooks who sold them fake visas for their family. When they would ask when the government was planning to deport them, the surprised agents would guarantee that that wouldn't happen and wondered why the heck would the victims of a crime think they were going to be punished for it. The two older kids of these parents would be forced to drop out of school and find work in order to help cover the new expenses of rent and deposits, ending up in whatever awful future that awaits minority children without an education. I couldn't talk. I couldn't breathe. I could no longer cry. My entire mental, cognitive, and emotional capacity was dedicated to self-loathing. I wanted to kill that bastard who did all those terrible things, and I didn't even care that it was me. I then realized I could hear myself thinking again, meaning that the fortune teller had finally stopped. 
I turned to look at her, and she was still staring at me. Now leave this place, she hissed. Leave and live every day with the weight of the suffering you've caused innocent souls. She then shrugged. Or don't. That moment, I heard laughter and footsteps approaching. I looked towards the open flap of the tent and saw two men dressed in basic undergarments, wearing clown makeup on their faces. Oh, excuse me, sir. This here tent is off limits. It's for us carnies, one of them said and winked. I was waiting for my tormentor to scold them, but when I looked at her direction, I saw nothing, nothing but an empty stool. Mate, the half-clown spoke again. I know you heard me. Now please, we still got a couple more hours of joyous hua. Do you mind? I mumbled an apology, got out of there, and started walking home. I'd initially meant to get a cab, as it was like 15 kilometers to my apartment, but for some reason, it simply slipped my mind. Maybe because every single person I saw, whether in the streets or on the road, had those same damned black eyes, seeing me, judging me, hating me. Vince blinked away some tears, made up some juvenile excuse, and sprinted away from there, and I do mean sprinted, running like a vicious wolf was chasing him. I was left there, filled with too many emotions to react. I kept quiet throughout his story, at first because I wanted to respect his wish and hear him out, but later because I found myself unable to decide what to say, not knowing if there was even anything to say to make things right for him again. That encounter with Vince behind the burger joint had taken place approximately two weeks ago. Three days later, Vince was found dead by his worried parents who had the fire department bash his door down. The coroner said he'd been dead for at least a couple of days. There's a fair chance he died right after I saw him that evening. At first, I blamed myself for not realizing how grave and dire his condition was. In a way, I still do. Then again, perhaps he made a choice like the old woman told him. I'll miss my friend, but if nothing else, I'm glad he at least had a chance to unburden himself before he died.